All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much to everyone who's on the call early to join the series Corporate Partners Communications Group. Um, we are just going to give everyone a few minutes to join us. So we'll start a few minutes after 2.30. Um, I know there's a lot of you on already. Um, so thank you so much. And we will get started shortly. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the series Corporate Partners Communications Group Call. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as a reminder, um, this group is a convening of communications experts from within both the series company network and also our BICEP network to learn from each other and also external guests about how we can best be communicating our sustainability achievements and policy positions, working that into brand strategy and messaging. For those of you who don't know me, this is Helen Booth Tobin. I'm the Communications Manager for the Policy Team in the BICEP Network here at Ceres. And I'm really thrilled to see how many people have joined us for today's conversation. And before we really get started, I am going to kick things over to Ann Kelly, our Senior Manager of Policy in the BICEP Network, to introduce today's speaker. Thank you so much, Helen. And I'm thrilled that so many of you could join us today uh, so many companies and so many of our series colleagues as well. I'm even more thrilled to welcome back our good friend, uh, Tony Leiserwitz, who joined us several years ago. Uh, we thought it was a perfect time for him to come back and give us an update on climate change and the American mind, which is his specialty. Uh, Tony is a senior research scientist and director of the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. He is an expert on public opinion and public engagement with the issues of climate change and the environment. Tony's research investigates the psychological, cultural, and political factors that influence environmental beliefs, attitudes, policy support, and behavior. And given that we are all in the thick of reevaluating the opinions in the U.S., and in particular with the renewed excitement on Capitol Hill, we thought it was the perfect time to, to bring Tony back to share some of his insights and thoughts and recommendations that are relevant for our work. Uh, just before he starts, I'll remind you that we, are, uh, we have enough people on the call that we're not able to do it in a conference call fashion. You are all muted. But do submit your questions through the chat function on the lower left, and you can do that at any time throughout this session. Um, this is being recorded, so don't feel that you have to take copious notes throughout. We will be sharing the recording afterwards. Um, and so with that, let me just turn it over to Tony. Thank you so much for joining us, Tony. Great. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Anne, so much for the invitation to join you all again. Uh, let me see if I can get the technology working and display my screen. And just to make sure, because somebody can give me a shout out saying, yes, it's working. It looks like it's working on my end. Um, I see your screen. Um, and if anyone has any problems, feel free to put something in the chat box and we'll troubleshoot it from there. And are you just seeing a single slide right now? Right now I see the, a single slide, climate change and energy in the American mind. Perfect. Okay, great. 
All right. Uh, okay, and let me just minimize that. All right. So again, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Uh, and uh, as Anne described, uh, I direct the Yelp program on climate change communication. Basically, we study how do Americans and other societies around the world respond to this issue. And so what I'm going to share with you a bit is uh, our latest results from a, over a decade's worth of work. Um, and you'll see some of the trends in a moment. But basically, we've been conducting two uh, very high-end nationally representative surveys of Americans' beliefs, attitudes, policy preferences, and behaviors around climate change and energy uh, for over a decade. Um, and so uh, we've seen some very interesting patterns emerge in recent years and even in our most recent data. And so with that said, uh, let's get into it. Um, so let's start at the at the basics. Like, do Americans actually uh, understand that this issue is even happening? And let's see if I can advance this. Okay, arrows are not working. There we go. Uh, and just to check, you have a slide now. Most Americans think global warming is happening? Yep, it's up there. Fantastic. Okay. So here's that 10-year trend I was just describing. And basically, as you can see, uh, on the left-hand part of this slide, you see back in November of 2008 when we started this uh, particular study. Uh, back then, 71% uh, of Americans understood that global warming was happening. But that dropped 14 percentage points, a really steep drop, uh, bottoming out in about uh, 2010. Since then, it's been kind of very slowly working its way up, working its way up until really just the past couple of years, we've seen a bit of a surge until uh, over on the far right, you see December of 2018. Uh, so just a couple months ago, our most recent study where we found that 73% of Americans now think that global warming is real. So, hey, this is something to celebrate. It's an all-time record high, except it's only 73%. Uh, if we were in Japan, this number would be over 95%. So Americans clearly have uh, some room to grow. Likewise, uh, uh, we're at an all-time high in terms of American understanding that this is mostly human cause. At 62% in our most recent survey, and importantly, uh, an all-time low, 23%, who say that it's mostly caused by natural changes in the environment. But that's, of course, still very important, and that is a, uh, uh, that there's still plenty of room to grow on this one, too, because if people think that don't understand that it's human cause, then they don't understand some of the policies that are being proposed, like, for instance, putting a price on carbon. Why would you do that? Why would you um, be trying to restrict coal-fired power plants, for example, uh, if it's just a natural phenomenon? So again, all-time record high, there's something there to be celebrated, but clearly a long ways to go uh, with basic understanding for at least some Americans. And also in relation to that is that we saw a big jump, and this is a very substantial jump, in those Americans who say that they were very worried about global warming from uh, basically a year ago, March of 2018, to December of 2018. Uh, it's very rare to see those kinds of, of jumps. And I can say a little bit more about what we think was happening there. But I also don't want to over, uh, you know, sugarcoat this. I mean, yes, it's an all-time high in terms of Americans very worried about climate change, but it's only 29%. Um, and that is because, as we've found for over a decade, many Americans still think of climate change as distant. Distant in time, that the impacts won't be felt for a generation or more. And distant in space. This is about polar bears or maybe some developing countries, but not the United States, not my state, not my community, not my friends, not my family, not me. And so as a result, it seems in many people's minds as this, it's psychologically distant. It's this issue that's one of a thousand other issues that is out there. Maybe I kind of wish somebody would do something about it, but it doesn't seem like a high priority. Um, so this is moving in the right direction, and that's really one of the bigger uh, points I'm making here, and I'll show that uh, more clearly in a moment. It's just these are the trends, but there's still plenty of room to grow for Americans to uh, adequately engage this issue. Um, and then back to the question of, well, what happened in that past year? Uh, we think basically, and if you'll please excuse the phrase here, but it was a bit of a perfect storm. 
2018 was an all-time record-setting high year for uh, billion-dollar disasters, and it came on top of 2017, which came on top of 2016. Um, and uh, and as you know, many of you remember, we had some really severe uh, hurricane damage done to the United States in Puerto Rico, which of course is part of the United States, uh, as well as of course the wildfires that were tearing apart uh, California and other parts of the American West. So that was one thing. One is that we Americans were are increasingly experiencing the fact that climate change is here and now, not distant in time and space. But here's the crucial piece of it, is that people don't just simply experience extreme weather or an extreme event and suddenly go, bing, climate change. Uh, for most people, they still need someone to help interpret what's going on, Okay, someone that's literally helping connect the dots. And historically, that uh, has that role has been played by the media, because most Americans do not read the peer review literature, much to the chagrin of my colleagues in science. Uh, they're not reading the IPCC reports. In fact, only 14% of Americans say they've ever heard of the IPCC, and I think many of them are lying or just simply are mistaken. Um, and they're not talking to climate scientists over the backyard fence. Okay? Most people only come to this issue, only know anything about this issue because of media coverage. Um, and so when the media does not report this issue, it's literally out of sight and out of mind. And if nobody's talking about it, how important can it be? Okay. Which is why talking about it turns out to be an absolutely critical, vital, foundational first step. And I, I can come back to that point later. Um, so what we saw in 2018 is that the media is starting, just beginning, has a long way to go to get better at this, but they are beginning to increasingly, at times, when reporting on one of those extreme events, to actually include the words climate change, to, again, literally help people connect the dots between this extreme disaster that's unfolding in their front yard or on their television screen with this broader phenomenon that's, of course, intensifying and, in some cases, making these these kinds of events more frequent. So. That's also uh, part of the of the package. And of course, the other thing that happens in 2018 is the release of the uh, IPCC uh, 1.5 degree report, which got a lot of media coverage um, because it basically was telling us we've got very limited time now to uh, hold the climate within one and a half degrees, which is would be a relatively safe space compared to two, let alone three or four degrees. Um, and we also saw the release of the National Climate Assessment, this congressionally mandated uh, report by the federal government scientists of the state of climate change in the United States. Um, that itself was a very important re uh, report with ever more um, uh, you know, warning signs in it. But of course, I had the additional uh, uh, factor of that the Trump administration decided to release it on Friday, the Friday after Thanksgiving. And of course, Fridays in general are the day that if you don't want anybody to pay attention to the news, that's, that's the time to dump it, um, uh, certainly in the federal government. And of course, there's almost no better time to do it than the Friday after, the th after Thanksgiving holiday when people are absolutely not paying as much attention. So unfortunately, that backfired because of course, everybody else in the news industry saw exactly what <laughs> what they were doing, and that actually had the ironic effect of probably driving far more media coverage of that report than it would have gotten if they'd released it on a Tuesday. So anyway, you put all those things together, and again, I think you get a bit of a perfect storm of why uh, public concerns about this issue uh, took, a, took a substantial jump uh, last year. Okay, one other way of kind of helping you see uh, the trends here, and I'm going to turn to a uh, framework that you may or may not have seen before, but is something we've been uh, developing for over a decade. And that's the recognition that there is no single United States or single American public. Um, and then too often people would say, okay, well, then there's believers and there's deniers. And that's far too simplistic. Uh, and as all of you know, as communications professionals, you know, one of the first rules of effective communication is know your audience. Who are they? Where do they come from? What do they know? What do they think they know? What are their underlying values? Where do they get their information? And who do they trust? Uh, all those kinds of questions are vital if you want to be effective at actually engaging people where they are, not necessarily where you are. So in, in the effort to try to better understand the American public, um, we, through our original study back in 2008, developed this construct called Global Warming Six Americas and have been tracking it ever since. 
So very quickly, uh, as you'll see on the far left, and this is as of December, 29% uh, of Americans are alarmed about climate change. And these are people who think it's happening, it's human caused, it's urgent, they strongly support action, but many of them don't know what to do. They don't know what they can do as individuals, and they don't know what we can do collectively uh, to address this issue. And that's really in part a failure of the climate community. We've done, in that sense, a far better job communicating the scale and seriousness of the problem to this audience, but not what the solutions are, let alone how they can get involved. Um, the second group is the concerned. These are people who think it's happening in human caused and serious, but they tend to think of it again as distant in time and space. So yeah, they would support action, but they don't see why this is urgent. They don't see why we need to take action now. Uh, then comes a ca the cautious, and you can think of these people as fence sitters. They're still, on, still trying to make up their mind. Is it real? Is it not? Is it human? Is it natural? Is it serious or is it kind of overblown? So they're paying attention, but just really haven't made up their mind yet. A small but important group that we call the disengaged who say, you know, I think I once heard the term global warming, but I don't know anything about it. I don't know what the causes are. I don't know what the consequences are. I certainly don't know what the solutions are. Then comes a group we call the doubtful, who say, yeah, I don't think it's real, but if it is, it's natural. Nothing we have anything to do with, nothing we can do anything about, so I don't see it as a risk, and I don't pay that close attention to it, but I'm predisposed to say, not a problem. And then last but not least are the dismissive, who are firmly convinced this is not real, it's not human, it's not uh, uh, a problem at all, and in fact, uh, many of whom literally are telling us that they're conspiracy theorists. They say it's a hoax, it's scientists making up data, it's a UN plot to take away our sovereignty, it's a get-rich scheme by Al Gore and his friends, and many, many other such uh, conspiracy-minded narratives. Now, critically, they're only 9%, but they're really loud 9%. They're really vocal 9%. There are 9% that are very well represented, in fact, overly represented in the White House and Congress uh, these days. But they are only 9%, even though they tend to dominate the public square. And much more could be said about that. Um, but here I want to get to what's been happening to these different groups over time. So here's the last five years, and what you can see is that there's been some pretty significant changes. The proportion of Americans who are alarmed about climate change increased 15 points in the past five years. Those concerned rose two points. The cautious are down six, and the dismissive and doubtful are down collectively 11 points. Okay, that's a major shift. And to really put a fine point on it, if you look over on the far left at 2013, You'll see that in 2013, the alarmed and the dismissive, those two groups that are the most engaged with this issue, you can really almost think of the middle groups as, you know, to a greater or lesser degree, not paying that close of attention to the issue. But it's the dismissive and the alarmed who really are focused on the issue and are the most vocal about it. Um, back then, they were 14% each. As of 2018, the alarmed are now 29% and the dismissive are just nine. So the alarm now outnumber the dismissive more than three to one. Okay? That's a major shift. And here's where you start to break that down and see, well, who's getting more concerned in particular? And here I'm going to switch to politics. Because here's a measure of global warming should be a very high priority for the President and Congress over that entire 10-year period. And I think you can all see the very clear pattern here. Democrats are getting much, much more concerned about this issue than uh, anyone else. Independents are also going up at an all-time high as a, at a 28% in uh, December. But Republicans have really been flatlined uh, pretty much the entire time. Um, and that, of course, should come as a surprise to no one that this issue has become very, very polarized. Here's another way of looking at this. Now, this is a very complicated uh, table, um, and there will be a quiz at the end, so uh, I expect you to memorize all this. Uh, but I'll just very quickly uh, highlight the few key things. We know that national issue priority is one of those key indicators that policymakers look to to decide what do I focus on, right? There are all a thousand and one issues that I, that I uh, could be working on. Which ones are, are the most important, especially if I want to get reelected? And so uh, climate change has traditionally been uh, a pretty low priority. Uh, here is a measure that we could – uh, conducted back in the primary season just a year ago uh, in the run-up to the 2018 congressional elections, and we asked, how important will the candidate's position on the following issues be when you decide who you're going to vote for in 2018? 
And global warming showed up overall across all registered voters as number 15, which is better than it has been in the past, but still it's clearly not a top tier issue. But then when you break it down by politics and ideology, it starts getting much more interesting. So here you can see we've broken it down by liberal Democrats, moderate conservative Democrats, liberal moderate Republicans, and conservative Republicans. And if you look at conservative Republicans, you see that global warming comes in absolutely dead last. Okay, again, really a clear indication of uh, how polarized this issue has become. Even among liberal moderate Republicans, who generally are much more engaged with the issue than our conservatives, it's still only number 23. But when you look over at liberal Democrats, it gets very interesting, because among liberal Democrats, it was number four, and environmental protection was number three. Those are top tier issues. And as a result, this I think helps contextualize and explain what's going on right now. So back in the fall, we saw a number of key congressional races where climate change actually became a part of the, of the, uh, uh, of the campaign. Um, and I think even more importantly, it's what we're seeing being uh, happening within the democratic primary process for the presidency in 2020 right now. Every single candidate that has uh, declared their candidacy for the Democratic uh, ticket uh, has already said that climate change will be one of their top priorities. And just the other day, you saw uh, Governor Inslee from Washington, who's now running, who has said, this will be the one issue that I'm running on. Okay. That never happened before. This is totally different than what we've ever seen in American politics, where the base, the liberal Democratic base, is very engaged with this issue. And in fact, I've seen some data that suggests that it's actually now the second highest issue because uh, sadly, gun policies has dropped in public priorities as we've, uh, as the memory of Parkland, which had happened uh, right before this, uh, has begun to fade. So the point is, is that this issue is going to certainly play a really important role over the next couple of years, especially in the Democratic primary process, whether it and to what degree it plays a role in the general election, I think is you know, way, too certain, uh, way too early to know. Um, but I think we can at least expect that this issue will get a lot of attention uh, over the, at least the next 12 to 18 months. Okay, so let's turn to just some solutions. Um, here's support for funding renewable energy research that's uh, increased over the past five years. And this is where it gets interesting. So yes, there is this hyper-partisanship about climate change itself. Is it real? Is it human caused? Is it a serious problem? But at the same time, there's a lot more consensus in the country, at least about some of the solutions. So here you can see that, you know, there's very strong, 88% of Americans strongly or somewhat support uh, a, a major investment in, uh, in uh, research for clean energy. And in particular, you see a 30 point increase among uh, conservative Republicans, uh, since 2013 uh, for this. Um, also very important is this long-standing, and you hear uh, those opponents of climate action say this all the time, is that, oh, we can't take action on climate change, or frankly, we can't even take action to protect the environment because it will destroy the economy and cost us millions of jobs. Okay, so I've always thought that was a false choice either or zero sum game, which just simply isn't the case. So we've asked the question in a different way. Do you think that government policies intended to transition away from fossil fuels towards clean energy will improve economic growth and provide new jobs, reduce economic growth and cost jobs, or have no effect on economic growth or jobs? And what you see is that overwhelmingly, Americans believe it will improve growth and jobs or have no effect. Less than one in five Americans, just 18%, say that it will actually reduce growth in jobs. And that's true across the board, even among conservative Republicans, 60% of them say that it will either improve growth or have no effect. Only 40% of conservative Republicans actually buy into the notion that it will harm the economy. So that's just to say is that, of course, there are, are always going to be trade-offs in very specific cases. But as an overall uh, value, as an overall attitude, Americans are pretty strongly convinced that this is all good for the economy. So we shouldn't be afraid of, of leaning in to uh, that argument. Uh, and of course, the Green New Deal has gotten tons of attention uh, in recent months. And so this is actually a question we asked back in December before 
you know, before AOC and Markey had released anything, before there were really any details at all. And so we wanted to see just at that early, early stage, um, how did people respond to the basic principles that were at least being talked about then? And what we find is that overwhelmingly, Americans say that they like at least the aspirational goals uh, that we described. Um, with 81% of uh, all registered voters saying, yes, they support those goals, and only 18% opposed. And that's even true among conservative Republicans. However, we weren't sanguine about that. We uh, warned back then that only, uh, that well, 82% of Americans had never heard of the Green New Deal at the time, and that was certainly going to change. Uh, and moreover, there's no way these numbers were going to stay this way because the attacks hadn't even started yet. And of course, we're seeing lots of attacks on the whole notion of the uh, Green New Deal, which seemed to only get crazier and crazier every day. I mean, uh, not only now is it about, you know, uh, banning the hamburger and all, and all transportation, but the latest I, I saw somebody actually argued on Fox that uh, the Green New Deal will lead to cannibalism. Uh, go figure. Um, uh, I didn't know that, but good to know. Thanks. So anyway, it's just to say this: these numbers will not uh, stay where they are, but it, it at least gives you a sense as to what Americans thought about uh, the, the aspirational goals. Um, also, interestingly, uh, a large proportion of Americans uh, support the idea of requiring electric utilities to use 100% clean renewable energy by 2050. Um, I don't think actually most Americans can make the distinction between a goal at 2035 or 2050, so don't take that number too importantly. It's really, again, their overwhelming support for the idea that we should be transitioning from fossil fuels towards clean and renewable energy. And then perhaps uh, more relevant to some of the people on this call, when we ask Americans, who do you think should be doing more to address global warming, and this is very consistent across the whole decade's worth of work, corporations and industry come out number one every single time. That's where Americans are looking for leadership first and foremost. Um, but importantly, they don't let themselves off the hook either. Uh, they say citizens themselves are also uh, uh, responsible for, for taking action. Uh, and then you can see uh, the various levels of support for um, the Congress, uh, Trump, uh, and, uh, and more local officials. Um, and then also perhaps relevant to this audience is that about half of Americans say that they would be more likely to purchase goods and services from a company that is committed to using 100% clean renewable energy. Um, and again, that does play out across uh, the, the parties, clearly much more strongly among liberal Democrats than among conservative Republicans. Um, and while we did not ask a question, a follow-up question in this one, I can almost guarantee you that when asked, if we had asked, why don't you, okay, and this is questions we have asked in the past, why don't you reward companies this way? Or alternatively, why don't you punish companies that are standing in the way of climate progress? The overwhelming number, number one answer, and it's by far, is very, very simple. I don't know which companies to reward or punish. Okay, um, And I think I've said this on earlier calls uh, that I've participated in before, you know, I'm not, I don't walk in your moccasins. I don't you know, I, I, I'm not uh, working in a corporate uh, environment. But if I were looking at that as a CEO, um, uh, that would either make my, you know, my mouth salivate or my knees quiver, because you're either on the right or wrong side of that. And I would be worried about two, uh, two groups in particular. One is environmentalists, because environmentalists may not have a lot of credibility when it comes to describing, let's say, the natural security threat of climate change or the health threats of climate change. Most Americans would like to hear from that, hear about that from a doctor wearing a, a lab coat and a stethoscope around their neck. But when it comes to naming, blaming, and shaming companies for their actions, Environmental groups have enormous credibility uh, among the public. So I would be afraid of that group uh, in particular, but there's another group I would be even more afraid of, and that is, of course, my competitors, because most companies are in very competitive uh, spaces, and there's a spectrum of sustainability and uh, carbon reductions across that sector. Uh, you know, to the extent that we're talking about one of the key barriers that people have to um, rewarding and punishing companies by preferring to buy 
or avoid buying uh, their products is just simply knowing which ones are good and which ones are bad, that's relatively easy. That's just a piece of information. That's just communication. That's not like trying to get somebody to switch from being a Democrat to a Republican, right, or change their underlying value system. That's hard. Um, this is just saying good company, bad company. Okay. All right. Uh, last thing I want to just quickly show you is uh, our work with the Yale Climate Opinion Maps. And that is really to address a common, common question we've been asked over and over again is, hey, look, this national data is great, but I'm, work, I'm a company working in Topeka, uh, Kansas, right? You know, what can you tell me about Topeka? And before, the answer was always, I can't tell you anything because we've never been asked to do a study in Topeka. Um, so we ended up building a, uh, a set of models that allow us to estimate uh, the public engagement with these issues at, uh, for all 50 states, all 435 congressional districts, uh, the 1,000 largest cities, and uh, 3,000 plus counties in the country. And uh, just to say, uh, they're very accurate, uh, like 98% plus accurate when we actually uh, compare them against independent surveys. And so let me just now show you, and let me just check again that you can see um, the Yale Climate Opinion Maps on your screen. Yep, we can see them, thanks. Okay, and are they big enough? I, yeah, I think so. Okay. Of I can course, make if it, anyone yeah. um, is having trouble seeing, um, send a note in the chat box and we can fix it. Okay, I just made it one, uh, one size bigger. Okay, so just to demonstrate, here is the national numbers for Americans who are worried about global warming, 61%. Okay, fine, that's useful. Um, but you know there's more going on below the surface than that. So here, let me just go all the way down to the county level. And you see that there's, in fact, far more variation across the country in levels of worry. And this is a great map. I get more and more out of it every time I, I stare at it. But let me just point to one of my favorite examples. So think about a state like Texas. Okay? Texas is often stereotyped, as, and rightly so, as a very conservative state, very red state, uh, had long been led by climate-denying governors, including Rick Perry. Um, doesn't seem like it would be the place where you could have a constructive conversation about climate change. Turns out that's not the case. Uh, if you look at all these counties along the border with Mexico, you see that they are as worried about climate change, in fact, many cases more worried about climate change than places in California. Okay? So why is that? What's going on there? Well, this is actually all relates to a whole other line of research that we've been doing over the years, and that is that contrary to common wisdom, which is that only upper middle class, white, well-educated, latte-sipping liberals care about climate change, it's just not true. The demographic group that cares the most about climate change in the United States are Latinos. They're more convinced it's real, that it's human caused, they're more worried about it, they're more supportive of policy action, they're more willing to get personally engaged to take action. Um, and uh, that's what you're seeing right there is that Latino effect. And of course that Latino effect is showing up uh, as well throughout the Southwest where they have particularly high concentrations of, of, of numbers. Um, so anyway, this gives you a quick sense as to what these can be done and the maps are pretty cool because they're interactive. So let's say you're interested in, oh, I don't know, Johnson County, Arkansas. You can just click on that and it'll zoom in and it will then tell you here's their beliefs, uh, uh, do they think it's human caused? Do they think it's affecting the weather, their risk perceptions, their policy support, um, and their behaviors? So let me just, again, go back out and give you a sense for a couple other things. So that's worried about climate change. And then we have lots of policy items here as well. Um, and let's go to how about corporations should do more to address global warming? Well, we find that there are majorities in every single county in America who think that corporations should be doing more. Um, the other neat thing about this is that uh, you can, um, the, this legend over here is clickable, so you can actually zero in on exactly the, the groups that are the most worried. And then you can also use this difference from national average. So the national average is uh, 61, oops, is that right? No, I think I'm still selected. Uh, the national average is 68%. Um, there we go, unselect. 
Uh, so then you can see where are the places that, let's say, 75 to 80 percent uh, are the most concerned. You can also use this difference from the national average. And so it basically sets 68 percent as the national average. And you can see those counties in green, darker and darker green, that are much higher than the national average, and those in purple where they are below the national average. But even the ones that below the national average are still above 50 percent, as you can see there. So there's the corporations. Um, but here's the last one I want to at least talk about is how often do people actually talk about this? So first is how often do they hear about it? Now let's go back to this. And you see that people say they rarely hear about this uh, in the media at least once a week, only 22% nationally. And when it comes to discussing global warming, it's only slightly better at 36%. Okay. So this goes into a much larger body of work that we've done that we call the spiral of silence, that many people just assume that no one else wants to talk about climate change. And to oversimplify, take Anne and myself, I may want to talk about climate change, but my perception is that Anne doesn't want to talk about climate change. It might cause a fight or something, and so I don't bring it up. Meanwhile, Anne actually is interested in talking about climate change, but her perception of me is that I may not want to talk about climate change, so she doesn't bring it up either. And because neither of us are talking about it, we get deeper and deeper into this downward spiral of silence where nobody's talking about it. Um, that is still an absolutely critical thing that has to happen in this society is that we talk about this. And you can look at many just you know, recent uh, uh, social movements. Uh, think of Black Lives Matter. Uh, and the Me Too movement is just two great examples of these are not problems that are new. These have been going on for hundreds of thousands of years in some cases. Um, it's just that we're now finally surfacing them and talking about them in hopefully sometimes at least constructive ways. But the point is that people are increasingly uh, uh, conscious that in fact these issues are real and that there are real discrepancies and, and uh, injustices being, uh, being done in this country. That's the power of talking about it. Um, so with that, I'll end and we'll open it up for questions. Wow, that was just absolutely fantastic, uh, Tony. And I, I couldn't help myself. I had to uh, indulge in this last set of slides because it was so interesting. I, I did go on to your web page. And if I understand correctly, this sounds like it's open source and folks can go on and use this map uh, at their leisure, your, cli your Yale Climate Opinion Maps. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, all open source. So just come, come to Yale Climate Opinion Maps or alternatively uh, just Yale Climate uh, Yale program on climate change communication, and you'll see uh, all of our work is available. Well, thank you so much. I also just wanted to underscore that was a pretty stark uh, comment you made about Texas and Latinos caring about climate change, which we've known, but I understand from your website you've actually done a whole separate report on Latinos and climate change that I guess is also uh, downloadable from your site. That's right. Um, so we discovered that pattern about 10 years ago, and then we finally got the funding to do an in-depth study to really try to understand why do Latinos care so much? I mean, why are they so much more engaged than any other Americans? And I'll just say as well that this is a pattern we saw clearly globally as well. Um, so we partnered with the Gallup World Poll uh, a number of years ago and did studies in about 120, 130 countries around the world. And one of the things that was really shocking about it is that every single country in Central and South America, without exception, views climate change as a greater personal threat than people anywhere else in the world, more than people in Africa, more than people in Asia, more than North America or Europe, and so on. Um, so we've long been uh, wondering what's going on, and what I think is increasingly clear is that it's cultural. It's something different about uh, Latino culture that um, uh, makes them much more concerned about this issue than other people around the world. Well, that's, that's fantastic to know and really good work. And, and um, thank you for the good news that you've reported uh, and also for the challenges you've given us. Helen, do you want to turn it over to questions? Yeah, thank you so much, um, Anne and Anthony. That was fantastic. Um, and we do have some questions that have already come in through the chat box, which I'll go ahead and ask. And then just to everyone else on the line, um, I'll go ahead and unmute you so you can um, jump in and ask a question or if you would like to 
um, submit one through the chat box um, or email. Um, I am happy to ask it for you as well. Um, okay, so the first question is, um, what is the most effective way for a company that is doing a lot on sustainability to communicate to the customer base that climate change is key to their business strategy, their values, their supply chain, um, et cetera. And, and then with that, um, you know, is there, have you seen in your research any trends on public, well, you kind of shared this, but anything to add, um, public expectation around corporate sustainability and action on climate from the point of view of either customers, employees, or otherwise? Sure. So, okay, so let's take that first one. Um, so I, I think the basic answer to this is strategic communication. Um, there's no simple answer to this question because it's all about who your audience is, okay? Who are your customers? And obviously, whether your customers are electricity purchasers or, you know, are buying running shoes uh, is going to make a huge difference in who they are, uh, how you would segment them, and that's what I would encourage you to be thinking about. Uh, and I'll just use our Six America segmentation uh, as a framework because we've used it um, with companies and, um, and with nonprofits to try to understand their own customers or their own members. Um, because what you find is that even in some big environmental groups, uh, there's a spectrum of, of audiences within their organizations, especially some of the big ones that, that kind of span the Democrat to Republican divide, um, which turns out to be really, really important because in the end, you want to engage each of those different Americas, those, whether they're alarmed running shoe purchasers to cautious running shoe purchasers to dismissive uh, running shoe purchasers in appropriate ways. And so there's, that's why I say there's no single simple answer to that. It's going to be very much dependent on who you are as an organization, your company, what is the product that you're selling, who is your particular current set of customers. Likewise, what is the larger, what is the segment, what would be a climate change segmentation look like to your larger market, right? Of all people who buy running shoes, not just yours. Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, because my guess is is that you've already in, you're already um, uh, succeeding with at least your core group of supporters, or at least you could if they know that you're doing it. Um, but then the question is, to what extent can you help communicate, and to what extent does that help you sell your product to those? Uh, you know, the, as we all know, the early adopters versus the early majority, the late majority, and probably the laggards uh, in terms of your overall potential market. So unfortunately, there's no simple solution to that. And whether the right channel is through you know, in-store uh, communication, whether it's through social media activities, whether it's through op-eds, whether it's through um, you know, advertising, totally depends on who that key audience is. Uh, if you're trying to influence, uh, you know, um, Wall Street investors, then op-eds in the Wall Street Journal is probably exactly what you want to do. You know, if you're just trying to engage, you know, uh, retail store customers, you know, all the op-eds in the Wall Street Journal aren't going to help. So it totally depends on who it is you're trying to reach. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Um, and I'll just pause for a second just to see if there um, is anyone who wants to ask a question live. Otherwise, I've got a couple more that I can ask. Um, okay, so I'll go ahead. Okay, so recently we've seen companies step out on social issues. Um, for example, a recent Nike ad, Crazy and Women with Serena Williams, or the Gillette Tosca Toxic Masculinity ad. However, when it comes to climate action, a few companies have placed ads highlighting their sustainability efforts specifically by showcasing their renewable energy purchases. But for mm -hmm. the most part, can't really think of a bold example of a company coming out for strong climate action. What can you share from your research that the time is indeed now for companies to take bolder steps on communicating that they stand behind climate action or sharing their sustainability story that can really capture the urgency for action right now? Well, I think the bigger thing is those trends I was showing earlier. So let me go back to that uh, right here. Hopefully you can still see that. The fact that the yeah. alarmed has increased dramatically over the past five years, I think that's where the trend is going. And if you just translate that 29% number, and again, these are people who already 
accept that it's happening and it's human caused. They're already uh, very worried about it, and they see this as an urgent problem. They overwhelmingly say they want to see companies taking action. They overwhelmingly say they would be willing to reward or punish companies for what they're doing. Um, these are people who are also overwhelmingly willing to get personally engaged to demand larger political action. Um, the alarmed, as of December, are now 73 million Americans. Okay? That's a lot of people. That's a big market signal. Um, and so um, I would look to these kinds of things. Now, look, in the end, as a, if I was doing advertising, let's say, for a company, this is where testing is absolutely vital, right? What kind of message is actually the one that's going to engage your potential market within, say, the alarmed? And I would start with the alarmed because uh, they're the ones who are already basically – you don't need to convince them of anything. They're, they're looking for ways to, uh, to basically vote with their dollars. Uh, the concerned um, are also kind of willing to do so, but they don't yet quite see the same value proposition. The alarmed, it's about – satisfying their their core need, their values based need to take action and to and to feel like and I would say this is really important looking to companies increasingly not just as the provider of a product or service but as a partner that will help me become more environmental myself, okay? As a customer, I want to uh to be loyal to a company that I see as somebody who's helping me and I can help them as well uh, reach towards that, those larger sustainability goals. So, and, and this is really you know, broader shifts that are happening within the marketing space that you all know far better than I do. But it seems to be me very clear that overall people are trying to develop deeper, more personal, uh, and more uh, loyalty-based uh, relationships with their companies than in the past and simply saying, okay, I can buy this product here because it's cheaper um, or just simply because uh, uh, I saw their ad. Um, and I think you are seeing a few companies that are already ahead of the curve here. So, you know, n perhaps unsurprisingly, there's Patagonia who's way ahead of the curve where they're not just asking their customers to prioritize these issues, but are actually working as a company to connect their customers to uh, advocacy groups on the ground in local communities uh, who are taking action to protect the environment. Um, that's a much different uh, approach than I think I've ever seen uh, companies take. And I'm not saying every company is going to should or, or wouldn't be willing to do such a thing. But it is to say that um, I do believe there's a, a strong um, core of, of base support, essentially, within the climate space that uh, are looking for support and are willing to reward those companies that they see taking leadership. Okay, great. Um, and I think um, I can, I'll can. i do one more question and um, kind of combine a few. Um, so one thing that we work really hard to do with our network is to build bipartisan support for climate change. Um, and as you showed, there seems to be in some ways a real gap between public opinion on climate and federal policy action on climate. Um, do you have any thoughts based on your research and your work on specific messaging that could be successful to help bridge that gap and build that bipartisan support, and what role can company voices play in that? Okay, so this is one of the big challenges. Um, so again, it comes down ultimately to values, that how can um, conservatives in particular who, and really this is deeper than climate change itself, what we see that one of the main um, barriers to Republican engagement with this issue, and I'm leaving aside fossil fuel money and you know the buying off of politicians and all that kind of stuff, put all that aside. On a values level is that many conservatives are suspicious, if not hostile, to the issue of climate change because they see it as uh, the only solutions they tend to see are those that seem like they're about growing the size of government. Because be long before climate change came along, there was this larger discourse, and frankly it goes back to the very founding of the United States and before, which is this struggle we've had in this country over what is the proper role of government in a society of free individuals. Okay. Um, we have been trying to work on that question for literally hundreds of years. 
Um, and those lines had been drawn long before climate change came along. And for many of the people who are the most dismissive of climate change, in fact, we see this very clearly, is that the, the academic term we call this is solution aversion, that when they see climate change, first of all, being promoted as an issue by people they don't like or trust, and let's just insert the name Al Gore here, for example, um, first of all, the messenger is often more important than the message. So if they see that this liberal politician who they didn't vote for and they've never liked is pushing uh, climate science, people just aren't very good at saying, you know, he's an idiot when it comes to politics, but when he talks climate science, he's really making a good point. I mean, human beings are just bad at that. Um, but the other is that many of the solutions they hear about are ones that seem to be all about growing the size of government and more taxes and more regulation and so on. So, uh, and that's what's, I think, been so interesting in this, uh, in the trajectory and the evolution of this issue, is that you're now hearing many, many more voices from hardcore conservative uh, right perspectives saying actually there are free market solutions to this issue. There are ways of addressing this that don't require bigger government or more uh, regulation that we believe, and this is them, their argument, uh, will be far more effective and much more cost effective than some of the things that you're hearing from, uh, say, liberal Democrats. That, when people begin to hear that, they, I mean, you would think logically that people need to accept the existence of the problem before they're then willing to talk about the solutions. It turns out that, at least in some cases, it's the opposite, that if you hear a solution that you actually are comfortable with, then it makes you more likely to accept that the problem is real, okay? Because, go figure, human beings aren't always logical. Um, so I think that's where we're starting to see some really interesting things happening where, and, and if you look at Congress right now, you're seeing a number of Republican members of Congress, sitting members of Congress, beginning to essentially poke their heads out of the foxholes that they've been hiding in for the past decade and saying, okay, we got it. Climate change is real. It's human caused. We know we need to deal something with it, but we're scared by the, you know, the, the, uh, proposals that we hear coming from the left, we think we've got a better uh, solution to that. And to the extent that that message gets heard and taken up, then finally this country can move on to the real debate we should have been having all along, which is how do we want to respond to this issue, not the stupid question, is it real or not, um, which for too many years we've been stuck at. Well, thank you so much for that um, that last answer, Tony, and also for reminding us, um, you know, the historical divide around the size of government that has been with us forever. I really like where you took this in the last few uh, minutes because it, it's just it's spot on in terms of what our corporate advocates are working toward, which is very specifically working with Republicans to try to move them toward a solution. And I wonder if you have concerns about what you, the, the last comment you made. I mean, I think we are probably um, somewhat guilty of leaping to the economically viable solution um, and not spending time on the problem in certain states where, I won't mention names, but where this is just a little bit more difficult. There are states where it's much easier to just talk about clean energy and not mention the words climate change. Uh, we work mm -hmm. with the Conservative Energy Network, for example. Do you see liabilities associated? I know you know this issue intimately, and I suspect you've thought about this. Are, do you have concerns about that approach where you're really focusing 80% of your energy on the economic benefits and job benefits of clean energy and right. the solution potentially of pricing carbon and we, you know, market-based systems without diving into all of what we know now about the problem itself? Yes, a uh, great question. And again, there's not a simple answer to this because context always matters. You know, who are you talking to at what point and what do you hope to accomplish? So I think there are definitely times and places where it doesn't help to talk about climate change or certainly not to lead with climate change. And in those cases, you know, as, as I've shown, there's a strong social consensus already around clean energy. That said, I think it's also a, a large strategic mistake to adopt that as a, as a strategy as opposed to the occasional tactic. Okay? And that's, I think we've got to always be careful not to let a tactic become our strategy by default. 
because the larger strategy is that the fact is is that we've dilly dallied now for three decades on this issue, and you know the longer we've waited, the harder it gets, and the more strongly and more boldly and more ambitious we're going to have to take action. And so that's going to include a whole host of actions that aren't just simply getting solar panels on rooftops or just you know promoting solar and wind energy. Um, we need things like a price on carbon. Uh, and it's really hard to talk about why we need a price on carbon and why we need it now if you're not talking about the underlying cause. So I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both and. It's just a question of which do you talk about when and in what context and, and again, to whom. But then I want to take a step back uh, from what I was just talking about in terms of engaging Republicans because this is the other thing that I think is happening right now that is absolutely critical and all the members of your network are a big part of this, and that is that we also at the same time desperately need to depoliticize this issue. And I think one of the most exciting things happening now is the fact that so many new voices are emerging to say, you know what, this is not just a scientist issue, this is not just an environmentalist issue, this is not just an issue for liberal Democrats. I think one of the most exciting things happening in this country right now are the companies that are stepping up and saying, you know what, this is an absolutely critical issue for us, either because it's a risk to our bottom line or it's part of the, the opportunity that we're pursuing because we can see this is where the future lies. Um, I think you're seeing it from the national security community. I think you're seeing the voices emerge from the religious community um, and so on and so forth, from doctors and, uh, from doctors and nurses. Uh, lawyers associations are getting involved with climate change. Social justice organizations are getting in with climate change. I mean, literally, you can go across America and find voices emerging from restaurateurs who are talking about climate change. Um, and that's absolutely crucial because in the end, the climate system does not care whether you are a Democrat or Republican or a liberal or conservative. It's not like, you know, the hurricanes are only taking out the properties of, you know, Democrats and not Republicans. And it's not like droughts in the Great Plains are only going to destroy the livelihood of liberal ranchers and farmers and not rep uh, conservative ones. We have to engage this as all of us. Uh, and again, not just at the national level. This is an issue that ultimately, ultimately, leaving aside the current administration, no matter who's president, is ultimately going to be dealt with at the state and local level because that's just where m most of the action is happening. And we have to come around together around those solutions. So I would say that's one of the most important things that your partners can do is to continue to amplify and elevate your own voices to say, you know what, this is beyond politics. Um, we're not doing this because we're a bunch of Democrats. We're doing this because we're companies that are trying to protect ourselves from the, the risks and also to help take advantage of the opportunities that lie before us. So um, I would just encourage you all to be thinking about how you can raise the voices of your own community. Well, thank you so much for that resounding close, uh, Tony. You are, you are speaking our language. I think you know that. Uh, for companies on the call who have wanted a briefing for their senior team, I think I would just take this recording and bring your folks in a conference room and turn it on loud because this is the message that uh, folks really need to hear. And it sets us up nicely for our big upcoming advocacy day where, you know, we believe, as Tony just stated, that the business case can transcend the politics. So could not agree with you more. Uh, Tony, thank you so much for joining us today. We very much appreciate it. We're going to follow your work and, and be on your website and um, keep in touch with you so we can keep up with your, your optimistic and current findings. So thanks so much. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to join you today. Absolutely. And thanks to all of you for joining us. As I said, very soon you'll, see, you'll receive a message from us and a link to the recording and slides. Uh, thanks so much. <laughs>